right few more seconds progress we have 35 it's okay can you guys hear me clearly or there's a background noise okay or not okay anyone can you guys hear me yes i can okay thank you uh, alia right, tadi all right so okay so we're gonna continue where we left off um which is well according to the naming of the lecture notes so it will be lecture two okay and um last week we have looked at how to actually make amino acid in the lab well, are they in the lab or in industry? Okay, so there are four uh, main reactions that you can utilize to produce amino acid. The helvohat zelinski HVZ, okay, reductive amination. So we've, we've looked at these two um, last week. Um, today, we're going to look at uh, the third one, Gabriel malonic ester and Strecker synthesis. And um, if you manage to cover everything, we're going to look at resolution kinetic resolution to differentiate between the racemic amino acid and then finally uh, if we still do have time we're going to move and look at the uh, start off looking at lecture number three or lecture number three okay uh, the notes labeled as lecture three all right so um a little bit of summary from last week we've looked at hvz where we have um something like that okay um so that's our i'm hearing a noise anyone actually unmuted or oh, it's just me okay just me okay so we've looked at uh, hvz where in the first stage you have uh, where it is a four stage reaction uh, where first one you have uh, try bromophosphine and bromine and then you have hydrolysis so from here you'll get an alpha substitution of uh, mahalogen okay and then after which um, you're gonna do uh, SN2 reaction with an amine excess of amine excess then you're gonna substitute the bromine to an amino Okay, so that's the basic principle. Of course, this one has everything else attached to it. Okay, and also we've looked at reductive ammunition where you actually have um, an alpha keto acid. Okay, so that is the um, alpha keto. Okay, and the first reaction, the first step of the reaction is to react with an excess of um, amine. Um, to get an intermediate of imin, oops, um, imin, okay, right. after which um, you just uh, hydrogenate it using palladium catalyst and thus uh, transform from an imin into an um, amine. Okay, amine to amine. Okay, so just a summary. So let's move on to the third one, uh, Gabriel Melonic Ester approach. So um, this reaction combines oops, this reaction combines um, two different chemistries or oh, two different chemistries. So to say, one is a Gabri Gabriel synthesis of amine, um, and second one is utilizing melanic ester. So the reaction itself is a bit more complex in comparison to the other two that you've looked at previously. Um, but nonetheless, the reaction is as simple as the other two. Okay, so why do we call it as Gabriel reaction? It's because we are using uh, phthalimide, 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 um, or in uh, some research article, they are actually they they actually mention um, using a sodium 
thalimide. So um, as structured here, okay. And melanic ester is because that is the melanic ester. Uh, oh, until here, okay. So it's a melanic ester structure, okay. So this is in um, not the same as an anhydride, where you have uh, an additional oxygen in the middle there and not at the sides, okay. So from here. You need to, simple things that you need to recall, um, Gabriel synthesis is just for thalimide. Um, I'm sure you guys will learn or have learned about Gabriel synthesis as well, okay, using the same structure. Um, and second one is melanic ester, is where you have two alpha hydrogens in the middle of the structure and um, the pKa of this alpha hydrogen is uh, relatively low, therefore it easily uh, depotronates, okay. Um, which one is which, then I'm pretty sure you guys know that one is Gabriel, that one is the melanic ester. Okay, so what are the steps? Uh, we will look at the um, steps, reaction steps for the particular reaction first. So the first step is to produce an alpha bromo melanic ester. So similar to um, HBZ where we actually um, functionalize our molecule to a halogen, okay? So this one, simple SN2 reaction, halogenation reaction using the first one. So it's similar to how we actually, we, we previously seen um, in the HPZ reaction, okay? So you use um, tribromophosphine, you're gonna activate um, forming um, uh, acid, okay? Uh, bromo acid first and then from the bromo acid then uh, br will then substitute one of the halogen okay um so you will get that one or okay and then from there so you can see number one here from number one number one will react with uh phthalamide via again sn2 reaction to produce um phthalamine <laughs> Uh, demolinic ester. Uh, it's a very long name. Okay. Um, so, SN2 reaction again, where you have, uh, I'm going to show you guys the mechanism after this, but it's pretty much um, same principle. Um, we have an alone a pair of electron attacking a nucleophile, and then you have halogen as the living group. Okay. So, it forms structure number three, which is the ester product. And then from this ester product, you react it with a base, okay? Because, because pre previously, you just substitute one of the uh, alpha hydrogen. Now, with a base, you're going to deprotect uh, or uh, not deprotect. You're going to capture the other uh, alpha protons to make, uh, to make a carbon cation in the middle there, okay? And in the presence of uh, your... Um, uh, halogen, okay, uh, alkyl halide. Um, so this will determine what type of amino acid you're gonna produce. Okay, so number three, um, sp4 readily undergoes another SN2 reaction. So most of the reaction is SN2. Um, even though you have a carbocation here, you don't call it as SN1. Okay, why? Uh, because towards the end of the day. Uh, if you recall in the basic principles of uh, nucleophilic attack and whatnot, um, SN1 is where you have the um, halogen as a living group first forming a carbocation ion on the, um, on, on the particular molecule, okay? In this case, your um, halide is not on the uh, melanic structure but rather on the alkyhalide as a coming uh, additional molecule. Okay, so that's why we call it as SN2 instead of SN1. Okay, so again, basic principles, you have a nucleophile, nucleophile attack on the um, alkyl, and you have um, halogen as a leading group. So you have another intermediate. Okay, so, and finally from there, when you have your final product, you're going to do a basic uh, acid hydrolysis with heating. So it's not just basic, uh, acid hydrolysis, it's hydrolysis with heating. So from there, you can 
um, hydrolyze a lot of esters and amides. So you have an amide if you look at the Gabriel molecule. Okay. Um, you have an amide structure over there. Not really directly an amide, a basic amide, but amide-like structure. Okay. You're going to hydrolyze there and there. And then at the same time, you have esters over here. You're going to hydrolyze all esters. Oh, I think the... The, the lines uh, moved a little bit, okay? So it should be there and there, okay? Hydrolyze and with heating, what happened when you have carboxylic acid and then you heat it up, so you heat up, you form carbo, okay? CO2. So my internet is a bit slow today, okay? You produce CO2, at the same time, you're gonna produce a racemic amino acid. So basic, basic structure, straightforward, um, on the process one by one. So this is just an example. Um, so instead of um, showing from the very beginning where you have your uh, Grebiel molecule plus uh, melanic ester forming this particular structure, so it's already shown that you have a photolimido melanic ester already. Okay, so with the presence uh, of base, the base is going to remove this um, hydrogens over there. You're going to form um, a carbocation ion in intermediate. And in the presence of um, a chlorosulfide here, you can get the chlorine will go out as a living group. Thus, you get a formation of bond between the last carbon and the carbon in the ester. Okay like that. So you have that intermediates and then again um, acid hydrolysis with heating you're going to remove all amides and esters thus you're going to form uh, a racemate uh, L and D in this case and methionine okay? um, and excrete out um, carbox, carbon dioxide and ethanol. Okay? So if you change as you change your alkyl halide you can get you can create your own amino acid of your interest okay and the fourth one is a striker synthesis um, it was first established in 1850 it's, it's a very um, old synthesis nonetheless um, we still use it okay um, so the he he actually found this by accident um, he just mixed up uh, acetaldehyde echo solution in an echo solution containing ammonia and hydrogen cyanide, and then when he analyzed it, he actually received, uh, he, he found something else. So he analyzed the reaction and found that this reaction, this is actually what happens, and he reported it, and thus we known the reaction as a Strecker synthesis. Okay, so uh, this product hydrolyzed to form resume aniline, aniline, okay, so this one, this product what uh, Strecker found a long, long time ago, okay? So you have a stellihyde in the presence of uh, ammonia. Of course, this ammonia needs to be in excess. Then when you have a hydrogen cyanide, you get an amino uh, peronatrile. And um, again, acid hydrolysis, then you get your amino acid, okay? So mechanism, the first one, the first step is a formation of uh, imine. So it's same as what we've seen in um, reductive ammunition reaction. So the second one, okay, so same principle where uh, the difference is um, in the reductive ammunition where you originally have an alpha keto acid. Over here, you start off with the N aldehyde. Okay, so that one is a carboxylic acid, where alpha keto are carboxylic acid, but this one you started off with aldehyde. Okay, so depending on what aldehyde you want. In this case, if you start off with acetaldehyde, then you'll get an alanine. If you change to a different type of aldehyde, then you'll get a different type of uh, amino acid, okay? So um, first you form um, the imine, okay? In that, in this case, from an acetaldehyde, you're gonna have something like that, okay? Imine structure, and then, where you have your um, cyanide, cyanide likes that particular position, and then in presence of water, uh, that will grab some water or hydrogen from the water. 
okay, not, not the water itself. And thus, you're going to form the alpha amino papyronitrile and then um, hydrolysis with, uh, in, in acid base with water. Again, uh, water molecules will uh, attack at this carbon, um, reactive carbon position, okay, um, twice so that you can get two um, oxygen groups, okay. So from here, you'll get your um, amino acid. Okay. Acid hydrolysis of cyanide with carboxyl acid test forming amino acid. Okay. So this reaction can be adapted to various natural and natural amino acid. So if you start off with two methyl butanol, then you'll get an isoleucine, two methyl propanol, you get valine, um, two phenyl acetaldehyde, then you get phenylalanine. Okay. So depending on what is the starting molecule, then you'll get the corresponding uh, final product. Okay. All right. So now Based on the four reactions that we've looked at previously, uh, we notice one similarity is that all the amino acids produced are in resume. Okay, and um, if you uh, if if you are to actually use it for chemical synthesis, what um, normally what you you want is something that is pure. Okay, and then enantiomerically pure, so that you can get an enantiomerically pure product. Okay? If you use a resume then the product will be racemate. If you use two um, racemate amino acid, okay, and if you couple it together, so two times two, then you'll get four different products, okay? LL, LD, DL, DD. So this is just for two amino acid. If as you carry on, then you'll get um, number of reaction to the power of two, which can amplify a lot. Um, and it might be good for combinatorial chemistry as we've looked at um, this morning, but uh, for a, a pure synthetic point of view, if you are to synthesize, um, say, um, an, an anti, anti body, not antibody, sorry. Uh, well, you can synthesize in the body, but normally you don't because it's very large. Um, antibiotics that consist of uh, peptides then um, this is something that you want to avoid. You want to always use an enantiomerically pure um, reactants or amino acid. So how do we actually do that? How can you actually do that? Um, and this is where resolution comes in. Resolution is the capacity to differentiate two items. So the terminology actually persists throughout. So say, for example, if you are thinking about or if you're talking about HPLC, so resolution in HPLC is the ability to distinguish two different peaks. Um, in this case, uh, specifically, is the capacity to differentiate two items. So in this case, the L and D. Okay. Um, so there are two options by which you can get an enantiomerically pure product. So number one is you can use a biological synthesis, uh, biological pathway because you, are, you know that uh, proteins, uh, for example, if you take it from, from an animals, uh, normally will just be an enantiomerically pure L amino acids, okay? So you can either take a protein from uh, an animal, um, hydrolyze it, and then extract out or purify so that you can get individual amino acid. That's one approach. Um, but, but if you do that, then the cost will be higher. Okay. Um, additionally, if you are looking at uh, the other perspective or the other side of uh, the options that you have, which is chemical synthesis, you can synthesize it in a very, very pure. However, um, if you are using the four that we've looked at previously, they are, uh, they, they produce a resume. Uh, second one, if you actually want to still use these four, but say you want to use a uh, HPLC column okay, to purify it, you can, but it will cost a lot. Okay, so how do we actually um, solve this issue is by combining both uh, options, which is using a bio uh, biochemical approach, okay, or chemo enzymatic uh, approach um, on the product uh, of the resume. Okay, so initially you synthesize it as a resume. Okay, um, you have L and D, and then you uh, subject it again to acetylation, so chemical and um, chemical reaction. So now you get an acetylated 
um, L and acetylated D, and then you use biology, uh, biological approach, which is an enzyme that selectively react to one of the molecule. Okay, so if you can do that, then um, you will get acetylated or deacetylated L and acetylated D. Okay, since this two amino acid no longer um, no longer are similar molecule in terms of the molecular weight, in terms of the reactivity and whatnot. So from here, you can actually purify this rather easily. Okay, in comparison, if you recall, an enteromeric uh, molecules or racemic molecule L and D, they normally have almost identical properties, chemical properties. Okay, when you have uh, one acetylated, the other one isn't, then the properties are different. And now you can actually work on it, whether you want to purify it or doing, uh, do something else. Okay, so how do we actually do that? Um, so racemic pro uh, amino acids is synthesized chemically. So this is the option. So initially uh, from the four inputs, so for four approaches that we've looked at previously, you'll get LND uh, racemic amino acid. You can use acetic and hydride. So it's very simple chemistry, acetic and hydride. Just put a little bit of base. You can get an acetylated um, L and D. So both of the amino acid now being acetylated. And then you can use um, an enzyme uh, amino acylase to actually selectively um, hydrolyze uh, one of the acetylate, okay, uh, acetyl group. So in this case, uh, this particular enzyme prefers the L derivative of uh, the L derivative of the two acetylated molecules, thus cleaving off the acetyl group from the L amino acid while leaving the D amino acid still acetylated. Does that mean um, the D will not will always be uh, acetylated? Well, the answer is no, because enzymes can have unspecific reaction. So uh, in, you might get like, for example, either 99% of uh, L amino acid and 1% or D, or maybe even less. So this approach is widely used. Um, Okay, so resume products was able to enzymatic reaction, and then you get this pure L, and this is what is being used. Okay, so selectively deacetylate the L derivative. So this is the amino uh, acylase. Okay, so this is not in your notes, but there they are alternative. Um, instead of just using uh, uh, amino, ac amino acylase from a pig, there is a fungus that actually produce um, another different type of amino acylase um, it is still a acylase so it function it has similar function in the sense that it will de um it, it will remove the the acetyl group from the l amino acid uh, but leave the d amino acid intact but um, the reactivity and whatnot are different so the fungus has 10 times or 10 or 30 times i can't remember um, lesser reactivity in comparison to the uh, peak amino acylase, amino acylase. Okay, so these are relatively on how the um, enzyme works. Okay, you, you do not need to memorize this per se. Um, enough or suffice to remember that there are uh, catalytic um, amino acids that that plays an important role in uh, the function of this enzyme. Okay. At the same time, this metal catalyst, okay, without any of these, without these four, without metal catalyst and without the three uh, catalytic amino acids, then the reaction will not proceed as smooth as it is. Okay. And this technique uh, is known or is called as kinetic resolution. Why is it kinetic resolution? Um, because when you have two of the uh, molecule only one will react, the other one is not, will not react, okay? So one is faster, one is slower. Therefore, you can call it as a kinetic. So, um, and resolution means that, you know, you're trying to separate these two molecules, so kinetic resolution. Um, can you have a thermodynamic resolution? Yes, you, you can, but 
thermodynamic resolution is not part of this particular um, approach. Okay, not not part of uh, how we synthesize amino acids. All right, so this approach is currently used to separate L and D amino acid and produce them by uh, used by industry since nineteen eighty nine. So a very very old technique, but nonetheless gold. Okay, so in summary, industrial application of amino acids. You we've looked at this before. Um, the main industries are pharmaceuticals, food, um, cosmetics, um, animal feed, etc. Amino acid can be synthesized by four paths. So we have uh, Helvoll Hadzelinski, we have reductive amination, we have uh, Gabriel Maloney Ester, and we have the Strecker uh, synthesis. Okay? And from all four of these, they will produce a racemic mixture of L and D amino acids. And then what you can do is you can use the kinetic approach or kinetic resolution approach to separate the L and D and thus. Uh, obtain a pure anatomically amino acid. Okay, so something that you need to recall, perhaps if you have forgotten about it, is a Santu reaction on the theory and mechanism. Okay, all right. So that's all for lecture number two. Since we do have time, we're gonna move on to lecture number three. Okay. If you do have any questions, just let me know. Um, you can stop anytime and, and ask. Okay, otherwise, I'll just continue waiting for it to load. Okay, I don't have any poll everywhere questions today uh, because my goal is just to finish up all the notes first. Uh, but we will have some next week. We're going to cover on bit on lecture two and what we've covered on lecture three okay all right so this one is named as l3 so output um learning outcome it's the same okay first assignment i do hope that you guys have started um writing up on this particular topic okay so you have two assignments 206 and 204 um 204 for this one is easier. You just need to dig up some information and then compile it, write it, and then submit. Uh, but for number S two hundred six, you do need to do a little bit of work. Okay. All right. Um, and due date is twenty six of April, so we have less than um, four weeks. Okay. So to complete, um, please um, start working on it. Um, okay. All right. So we're going to look at today uh, the protein structure, the basic protein structures um, available. Uh, we've looked at amino acid synthesis. Now we've moved back to protein structure. And um, um, I think you guys have uh, did learn or touch about protein structures, amino acids, and whatnot in a different course. Um, but this time around, I'm, I'm just going to cover it. Again, if you have learned about it, it's good. It's kind of like a refresher. But if you haven't, then hopefully you've learned a few uh, things or two. Okay. So what do we know so far is we do know that uh, a polymeric form of amino acid forms a protein. Okay. So either you want to call it a peptide first, and then from a peptide to a protein, or straight away amino acid is protein. It's fine. Um, it's the the naming system varies and um, depending on uh, which journal you are reading you, you can have different definitions okay so amino acids are so in, in other ways um, you know if amino acid forms protein then uh, you can say amino acid is the building block of a protein okay so the structure is like this again this is very simple very straightforward i do think that you guys have learned about this so you have a protein and a protein has a backbone Okay, so even though you, you will see later that some amino acid, we do have a cross link between uh, two or more uh, peptide backbone, okay, or protein or peptide backbone. So in this case, a protein backbone, you have amino acid. So what else um, you need to look at? So we need to know the nomenclature of a proteins itself, it just uh, based on the structure, structural level. Um, 
Okay, so we will learn this as we go because in the future, when, once we touch uh, more on the uh, proteins examples, then we're gonna uh, recall this back and forth. Okay. All right. So basically, there are four levels of protein structure. We have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. What are the differences? Primary structures are basically a sequence of amino acid. So say, for example, if I were to write alanine, 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 glycine, alanine, proline, proline, phenylalanine, tyrosine, trip, um, threonine, tryptophan. So this sequence are what we call as a primary structure, Okay, just the basic sequence. So when this sequence form a, a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional structure, um, in the sense of um, a, a unique more structure, okay, a more defined structure, not unique, a more, a more defined structure. For example, alpha helix, beta sheet, coil, etc. So there's there's a, a more different types of structures. Um, helix, alpha helix is part of a helix structure. You have three ten helix, you have uh, quadruple helix and whatnot. So multiple types of structure. Okay, beta sheet. We're gonna look at um, parallel, anti parallel. And, and coil, we're not going to look at it in, in detail, but just suffice for you to know that in the secondary structure, this basic sequence of amino acid structure, amino acid uh, forms a specific structure, okay? The coil um, or sheet or helix. And when, when we call it as a secondary structure is where this particular region form only one, either helix, or a beta sheet or a coin, okay? So only one. So if it forms a one, then we call it as a secondary structure. So in one peptide, you can have multiple secondary structures. So you can have one helix here, one uh, coil there, one another helix here, okay? So if you consider just one of the helix or one of the beta sheet, then you could consider that as a secondary structure. So when you have these two secondary structure, okay? Um, interacting with one another, then it goes to a higher level that we call as a tertiary structure. Okay, so uh, it's a three. Doesn't mean that the secondary is not a three dimension. It is still three dimension, but if you compare a secondary and tertiary structure, a tertiary structure has a more uh, complex or unique uh, three dimensional structure. Okay, so it forms of two or more secondary structure. So then you call it as a three dimension. So if you have, oops, another sequence up here, okay. So say for example, um, this forms a beta sheet. Of course, it's impossible, but anyhow, um, this is just a, a practice. And then that one also forms a, a beta sheet, and they are actually connected somewhere here, okay. And this beta sheet falls to itself and um, reacting or with one another. Okay, forming bonds and whatnot, then you can consider it as a tertiary structure. Okay, and then once you have, okay, so imagine this one is one polypeptide bond. Okay, but if you have another polypeptide bond, which are not connected between those two together, okay, but this one also forms beta sheet and beta sheet, and this one interact with uh, this one, this one interact with that at the same time. It's also interact between these two different polypeptide chain. Then you move from a tertiary level structure to a quaternary structure. Okay, so a quaternary structure is where you have two or more polypeptide chain um, reacting with one another to form a, a structure, a, a massive or bigger structure. So that's the uh, four le basic levels. Let's look at in a bit more detail. So a linear sequence of amino acid is the primary structure linked via a covalent bond or amide bond or a peptide bond. Okay, so just a normal feature. Uh, we can refer back to lecture number one if you want to, but otherwise it's just a normal feature. Okay, covalent bond, amide bond, or peptide bond. Okay, and then the shape of a protein depends on a primary structure or the core itself, since side chain and the amino acid arrangement sequence will determine how the protein folds. Okay, so how, what's the uniqueness of the side chain that we've 
uh, looked at previously why do we need to synthesize um, a unique set of amino acid is so that you can have a different interaction occurring between the uh, R group of the amino acids. Okay, so the interaction can come from an R group to an R group, an R group to a backbone, um, or backbone to a backbone. So there's there's multiple interactions we're gonna look at uh, as we go along. Okay, so this is what it means by uh, side chain and amino acid arrangement sequence. So arrangement sequence also play an important role. So say for example, you have this particular sequence, right? Okay. Um, if you still use the same number of uh, amino acid, you jumble it up, most likely the structure itself will change. Okay. So that what that is what I mean by amino acid arrangement and sequence. So even though you have the same number of each amino acid, uh, but depending on how you arrange it, you can get a different types of structure, okay? So um, for this particular example, you're gonna look at the level, the different level of structure using insulin as uh, an example. Okay, why insulin? Because insulin, for one thing, it has two different polypeptide chain not connecting to one another via the backbone, okay? So you have chain, chain A and chain B, and that's a sequence, sequence for chain A, and that one is a sequence for chain B. Okay, and since it's just a uh, primary structure, so it's just a list down of the amino acid sequence. So if you move further up to the secondary structure, then you can get a little bit of three-dimensional um, arrangement. Okay, in this case, uh, we, we put it as a spatial arrangement or confirmation um, whether it's alpha helix or beta sheet and so on and so forth, okay? So a sequence of amino acid will form an X type of structure in a three-dimensional space, okay? So X type can go again um, for this particular course. I'm just going to focus on the, these three, okay? Which is alpha helix, the beta sheet, and the random coil. Okay, so just these three. I'm not going to touch on the other ones. But suffice to know that there are different types of structure. So what you've learned today is just basic um, so that you can see or grasp the concept a little bit. Um, if you are interested, then you can read further. Okay, so secondary structure can also be described, um, can also describe how the segment of a protein backbone folds. Okay, so say for example, if you look at um, second structure over here, you can see that um, if you look at the green ones over here, it forms an alpha helix. Okay, so from this alpha helix, that is that particular that is the sequence corresponding to the alpha helix. So from here, you can uh, perhaps suggest that in the future, if you do see this particular arrangement S L Y Q L E N Y in a different protein, then you can actually predict that. This sequence is most likely will form an alpha helix. Okay, so normally the the sequence are relatively conserved, even though this is not the only sequence that can form alpha helix. Um, but just to mention that it is actually uh, it can be conserved uh, to a certain degree. Okay, uh, meaning that when you have the sequence, you found it in a different protein, then you, you can actually predict um, that this sequence actually form alpha helix. Okay, so um, three secondary structures. Um, again, just to uh, repeat, there are three main structures. We have alpha helix, you have a beta sheet or beta plated sheet, um, just a different nomenclature, or coil or random coil. So um, nowadays, the word random is hardly being used, but it was originally known as a random coil because people have no idea why it doesn't form any specific secondary structure like alpha helix or beta sheet but rather just from like, you know, uncontrolled manner. Uh, but nowadays, uh, a coil is not, uh, so to say, random um, because they are functions on perhaps uh, controlling the movement of the proteins. Okay, if you have um, alpha helix and beta sheet, the structures are more rigid, so they don't really move a lot. So the section of a protein that can move uh, or, or more flexible than the others are the random coil. Okay, or, or random coil. So this is an example of an insulin. 
Okay, uh, what is shown here is actually um, two insulin interacting with one another uh, before, uh, what was it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, before uh, giving out signals to cascade um, some uh, mechanisms in the cell. Okay, so normally a long time ago, we you scientists just thought that insulin works individually. So one insulin just works in, in the, um, uh, working on um, a glucose molecule, but uh, this research has actually shown that it can be a dimerization of insulin, uh, and that and thus they actually work in tandem. Okay, um, but yeah, that's, that's what they found. This is not my research, of course. Okay, so from the figure, you can see that the polypeptide chains are flexible, yet they are uh, conformationally restricted. So restricted to either um, in the in our case, it's an alpha, beta, or coil, okay, A, B, or C, but nonetheless, it's still flexible. So what I mean by that is, yes, it, it can move a little bit. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it's static. It doesn't move at all. So it does flex a little bit. So we're going to look at a few theories um, in the future, okay. There are three factors that influences its folding. Number one is a plenary region about the uh, peptide bond. So if you recall, if peptide bond is like that, okay, so you have a lot of lone pairs here, and then from the lone pair, it forms a, a pi bond, okay. So uh, a pi bond, um, regardless of whether it's, it's an empty um, uh, orbitals or not, nonetheless, they can form, okay. So this is where you can get a resonance structure, and thus, because you have a partial resonance here, um, Therefore, it says it's almost planar region. Okay, so this particular region are uh, almost planar. Okay, hydrogen bonding, the strongest uh, non-covalent bonding in biology. So we will look at in, in more examples on how hydrogen bonds or how many hydrogen bonds are there in this particular structure, alpha, beta, and alpha and beta structures. Okay, and you do have a steric hindrance that also play an important role in um, some of the structures. Okay, so look at factor number one, which is the regional planetary about the peptide bond. Okay, so again, as I mentioned previously, uh, due to the possible resonance structure from the uh, pi orbital, okay, yeah. empty pi orbital, uh, or, or it does contain a, a lone pair of electrons. Um, so partial double bonds prevents free rotation about the peptide bond. So the carbon and nitrogen and the two atoms um, to which each is attached are held rigidly in plane. Okay, so those structure pretty much. So if you were to kind of like look it from sideways, you can actually, well, they, they are not really total flat, okay? Um, because if, if you can actually see, if you open pi mole um, and, you know, look at your own uh, enzymes, you can actually see that they are, not really strictly planar, so to say. Uh, they they skewed to sideways a little bit, uh, but nonetheless, it is almost planar. Okay. All right. Why do I go back? Okay. So um, a partial double bond character prevents free rotation. Okay. So similarly, if you um, so this is an example. If you look at from the side, so chain A of an insulin, you can actually see that this. Is slightly bent, okay. So that that particular region. So this one is an oxygen. That one is the um, NH. So it's not really flat like that, but rather it bent a little bit, okay. And of course, the bend bending has motion, so it can have a bit of flexibility uh, in that particular region. So when you have a long peptides, so or, or, or protein sequences, then it can actually fold because of the small flexibility that exists um, helps in the protein folding, okay? So in contrast to the peptide bond, uh, in contrast with the peptide bond, the bonds connecting to the alpha carbon are pure single bonds. Um, the two adjacent rigid peptide units may rotate about these bonds, taking on various orientation. This freedom of rotation about two bonds, each of the amino acid allows protein to fold in many different ways. So this one, we are talking about that particular section over there, okay? So you can have a rotation over there, 
and you can have a rotation over wait sorry um so this one is the same memory set so this one is the rigid ones so you can have a rotation over here and a rotation over here okay not that one so each individual amino acid so pretty much the planar region is in the middle and then both of the next connecting bonds are freely rotatable okay except for proline proline is a bit um strict um but yeah nonetheless that's the basic concept all right so factor number two hydrogen bonding so we have about five more minutes um it's the strongest hydrogen bonding in a biological system okay so uh excluding um covalent bond okay so it is this strongest uh bonding uh non-covalent bonding in the biological system okay so, uh, not simply just the strongest bond strongest non-covalent bond so maximizing the number of peptide groups that engage in the hydrogen bonding uh, hydrogen bond between the carbon uh, carbonyl oxygen of one amy amin amino acid and the amine amide hydrogen of another to minimize energy okay so um the bonding strength is about that much i think you've learned about uh, hydrogen bonding before so again this is just a refresher okay so hydrogen bonding forms between a proton and electronegative atoms o and s in this case for amino acids is normally just the three so if you consider the uh, possible number of um, hydrogen bonding formation, um, it's if you consider that's just the side chain, then it will be this amino acid, serine, threonine, cysteine, um, uh, ASN is uh, asparagine, glutamine, histidine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Okay, and also all the polar uh, and charged residues, and of course, if you consider just uh, the amide bond then pretty much all amino acid can form hydrogen bonding okay so this is just an example of an hydrogen bonding um, uh, glutamine and um, serine having um, from its both are um, the side chain okay the side chain of a serine with an oh and side chain of a glutamine with uh, amide like um, structure Okay, forming hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding also is very, very um, obvious and very important in alpha helical structure. Okay, it forms, it is the uh, bond that helps the, the spherical helix together. Okay, so um, alpha helix is a subtype of helix structure. So this one is, I'm talking about 310 helix and whatnot, but you know, nonetheless, a helical structure, the hydrogen bonding is basically between uh, 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 the polypeptide chain, okay, the backbone itself. It's not from the R group, but rather on the uh, backbone. So if you can see on the right hand side here, okay, so this is the polypeptide bond, polypeptide chain. So it connects to one another and continue on connecting until the very end. And, and it's in a kind of like a circular motion, um, spring motion, kind of like going from up to the bottom, okay? And from here, you can see you can have the amide from one chain forming a hydrogen bonding to an amide, okay? So that's the amide structure from a, another chain, okay? So the amide bond, the hydrogen bonding goes throughout the structure from... Um, one amide group to another amide group okay so uh, l amino acid produce a clockwise coiled structure right hand turn okay so this is just uh, image uh, right hand turn helix is going that way okay left hand turn is going that way and there are about 3.6 amino acid per turn so if you consider that um, amide with this amide so if you count the number of amino acid and then you average it out, the distance of, not distance in space, but distance in number of amino acid is roughly about 3.6 amino acid per um, residue, okay? So you found one and then the next one is after 3.6 amino acid. And for this helix uh, specifically, 
the length or the size, the width of um, the hydrogen bonding between the two um, peptide uh, uh, amide functional groups are roughly about 540 picometer. Okay. So very small. Um, okay, so this is again just to show you guys um, on the connectivity. So this one is about 3.6 um, residues again. So if you average it out, then you get roughly about 3.6 um, residue. And this is how it looks like from the top. So you have hydrogen bonding uh, going on there and there and throughout the structure. Okay. And if you are looking at the top, then it will just form a, a spherical right hand turn, spherical cylindrical um, structure. All right, so I think I'll stop there first. Uh, we'll continue and look to look at the hydrogen bonding uh, with regards to alpha helix um, next week on Tuesday, okay? Um, because I wanted, my plan is to finish out all alpha helices, but unfortunately we cannot do that. We don't have enough time. So I'll just stop here first and continue next week okay thank you and um, have a good day everyone thank you doctor thank you doctor thank you welcome Start